have Paul Kellogg, who teaches at Athabasca University, I understand is recently tenured. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, he writes on political economy and social movements. He maintains an occasional blog at polecon.net. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Very interesting, and I have to change my talk as you were speaking. You did such a wonderful job on describing the actions of the March action. Um, John's outlined some reasons in terms of contemporary politics why we might want to look at this period. Um, my motivation is a little different. Uh, the, this period of time, right after the Russian Revolution, through the Russian Revolution into the German almost revolutions of 1919, 1921, 23, in my experience has been transmitted, now this is a bit of a caricature, but has some accuracy, I think. If only we had had revolutionaries like the Russians in Germany, we would have been fine. There would have been the overthrow of capitalism, and we would have had socialism instead of the descent into fascism. In other words, there was a a level of experience and intelligence in the Russian Revolution that didn't exist amongst the Germans who were by and large inexperienced, too young, too ultra-left, making big mistakes. Um, isn't that a tragedy? We need to learn from the Russians, do what the Russians did and not do what the Germans did. That's a bit of a caricature, but not that much of a caricature. And I've come to the conclusion, in part through reading this magnificent book by Pierre Bouet, The German Revolution, it's a wonderful book. It looks intimidating in its length, but it actually <laughs> is actually, a, if you're interested in this history, it's a, and he, he writes quite well. Bouet is a brilliant theorist, a brilliant historian. I've changed my mind, and I think that it's actually almost the, for people in Canada today, in the United States, it's almost the reverse. That there are deep lessons from within the German left and the workers' movement from 19, in that period of time, from people like Paul Levy, who we'll talk about, and Rosa Luxemburg, who's more well known, and Clara Zetkin, and that current of thought that they represent, there's a tremendous amount of their experience that we can learn from, and that in many ways they had a better understanding of how the left should operate in conditions of Germany than the Communist International did, than Lenin and Trotsky, and the, uh, the people from Russia. And that's not surprising, at one level, <coughs> Russia was a completely different kind of society than Germany. Germany was one of the few, the handful of, the, of you know, quote unquote, advanced industrial societies of the time. Russia was just emerging into modernity in a certain sense, 140 million peasants, 10 million workers, working class people in apartments, living in unheated apartments, tend to a room. It's, it's, the conditions are quite, quite stark between the difference between the two places. So that's my motivation in terms of looking at that, and that's where I'm coming from. In terms of looking at this, Paul Levy, after the events that um, John described, wrote a pamphlet, Unser Wag, which means our way, it was our way against putschism, because from his standpoint, he said the events that John described were forced on the working class in part by horrible advice from the German Communist Party leadership and from the representatives of the Communist International, from Bela Kuhn in particular, and Alexander and Zinoviev, if I don't remember his first name. Um, he says it's a putsch, it's a coup d'etat. It's an, it, not a coup d'etat exactly, but a putsch, an attempt to force, have a minority current force events even when you don't have uh, support in the majority. For the party wouldn't, um, he twice attempted to present these views to the, his party, the Communist Party, they wouldn't listen to it, so there, then he published it independently for this offense, he was expelled from the party. So that's Paul Levy's experience after the March action. Bela Kuhn, the Hungarian disorganizer, I like that term, hired by the common, he was the principal organizer of the Communist International, hired to do, to, you know, transmit lessons of the Russian Revolution to the, to the European left, to work with uh, organizers on the ground, has a heavy responsibility for the catastrophe of the March action, a heavy responsibility. He played a very, very significant role in changing the shape, helping to change the shape of the German leadership side, pushing Clara Zetkin aside, pushing Paul Levy aside, um, encouraging this sense that we can do stuff even though we're a very small minority of the class. The vast majority of the working class looks to a different party, the Social Democratic Party. He wasn't expelled. And the cost, let's, let's actually focus on what this meant, for, what this catastrophe meant for the German party. Four members were sentenced to death. 
uh, at least a thousand sentenced to extremely long jail terms. Tens of thousands lost their jobs. So people who, so they, they lost not just their jobs, but their capacity to organize as workers inside the workplaces. And as John mentioned, hundreds of thousands left the party. The party had just become a mass party and it was reduced again to a party not much bigger than what it had been before the union with the uh, left wing of the United, uh, Independent Social Democratic Party. Bella Kuhn has a heavy responsibility for m some of this, the, 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 these, this catastrophe. He wasn't expelled. Far from being expelled, he kept his job. He kept being employed as a principal person in the common term. In 1922, on the fifth anniversary of the Russian Revolution, there were three speakers to honored at the, I think it's at the third congress of the Communist International, one of the congresses of the Communist International. First speak, one of the speakers was Lenin, one of the speakers was Clara Zetkin, who was a close comrade of Paul Levy's, but the third speaker was Bela Kuhn. So not only is he not marginalized, he continues to play a, a leading role in the thing. I want to suggest that this is not just a, a personality issue. That's at stake here are uh, some pretty important political issues that the current thread that I think we can get from Paul Levy, Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg, and that wing of the party, and Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, we'll get into that later. There's, there's a section of the Russian experience that, that, that is united with this uh, politics. is an emphasis on self-emancipation, and that's an emphasis on the fact that socialism is only possible when the vast majority of the working class and the oppressed emancipate themselves. It is, not the action, it, is not, it is not possible for a minority to emancipate the majority for the majority. This is an act of the majority itself. This is uh, for Rosa Luxemburg from her pamphlet, Where does the Spartacus, What does the Spartacus League want? She says the following, The Spartacus League will never take over governmental power except in response to the clear, unambiguous will of the great majority of the proletarian mass of all Germany. That's a sentiment of self-emancipation versus, we, and sometimes the left, we throw out the term ultra-leftism to describe the, uh, uh, the thing that was ex expressed in the March action. I'm going to call it substitutionism. The attempt to substitute for that majority the actions of a small minority. Say, we don't have the majority, we'll act anyway, and see if we can spark, as John says, spark. The, uh, sometimes you can spark big things, but be careful with that, and if you elevate substitutionism to a high level. So I want to suggest that those are the politics at stake. Third, that this is not just at stake in terms of individuals. It's not just a question of Paul Levy was a self-emancipationist, he had other characteristics too, and Bella Kuhn was a substitutionist, but that tension between self-emancipation and substitution is deep inside the experience of the Russian left, which was the most influential section of the left in Europe at the time, without any question. The Russian Revolution in 1917 for good reasons, elevated the Russian experience as, you know, this is the thing that we need to learn from. There's reasons for that. But the Russian revolutionary experience was a divided one for reasons inev inevitably divided because of the nature of the revolutionary experience in, in Russia, in part an urban revolution against capitalism, also in part a peasant revolution against semi-feudalism in the countryside. And that we have in our day in Canada and the United States, more to learn from the urban side, the self-emancipationist side, than the other one. Okay. The, the March action period that I won't, I, I won't go over the details that John so eloquently described and summarized. I look at those, that period of time, January, March, I, I don't do it in chronological order. January 1921, March of 1921, and February 1921, so January, March, February, as triumph, tragedy, and farce. The triumph, I mean, Communists have been very, very, very small. After, around Rose, when Rosa Luxemburg was assassinated and Karl Liebknecht was assassinated, they had a few thousand members, but then this vast, you know, big working class, a very, very small current. The triumph was what John, when, when, what John described when they were able to unite with the mass party, the left wing of a mass party, the United Social Democrats, suddenly they had 400,000 members, 350, 400,000 members in January 1921. This is a huge accomplishment for this openly revolutionary group to have 350,000 members. It's a fantastic thing. And the open letter that John talked about was a, a tremendous accomplishment. Because the, the argument was, okay, we're 400,000, that's good, but the Social Democrats are 4 million. We have maybe 10% of the working class, they have 40 or 50% support in the working class. How do we win? How do we influence the ranks 
self-emancipationist perspective, we need to influence the ranks of the bigger party, they put out an open letter saying, we have differences. Someone, some people here are in the one party, we're in the Communist Party, but we have a capitalist class which doesn't care about these differences. It wants to cut our wages, it wants to attack our housing, it wants to attack our conditions. We need to unite against those attacks. The open letter, the best part of this brilliant book, if you want to start, start on page 471, okay? Because a lot of people say, oh, the open letter didn't go anywhere. It was, it didn't, it, well, it didn't go anywhere with the leaderships. The leaderships of both parties didn't like it very much because it undercut their bureaucratic place in society, one level of putting it. But at the base, it did. Uh, Pierre Brouet quotes, he says, uh, he says it had a, the open letter had a powerful echo inside the workers, despite its opposition for the treaty and bureaucracy, in country after country, uh, 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 town after town after town in the country, meetings were held, assemblies, democratic assemblies, in order to impose the demands of the movement upon the leadership. Such meetings took place and the communist proposals were approved by workers who were either not in parties or were members of one or more of the workers' parties. These took place in Danzig, Leipzig, Halle, Essen, that's of steel workers, of railwaymen in Leipzig, Schwerin, Brandenburg, and Berlin, the National Congresses of the Saddle Makers, the Carpet Weavers, the meetings of the miners in Dortsfield, the large workers gathered in Jena, all of these fully endorsed the open letter. What a wonderful thing. This is a moment where the, 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 the argument for unity is allowing the minority communists to get a hearing amongst the mass of the working class. It's a, it's a triumph. It's a triumph, and it's the kind of thing that we can learn from about how we can operate, because the left is very small, and we have a constant task. How do we get a hearing in the wider milieu that's influenced by the NDP or the Liberal Party? I teach in Alberta. It's influenced by the Tories, by Wild Rose. You know, you, know, you, you get the picture. Okay, slip to march. What John described, the march action, is a tragedy, because that, that triumph of, the, of January, that opening up, that possibility of, of, of gaining a hearing is when you say, I'm, when I say I'm going on strike, John and I are going on strike. In fact, we're all going on strike. Who decided? John and I decided. You lot don't want to go on strike, so we arrive at your workplace with clubs and we're going to beat you until you leave the workplace. You know what that, it's not a good method for winning a hearing with other workers, just to say. You know, it's a, it's a bad, and I'm only partly exaggerating. There were moments where workplaces were attacked uh, and with, it firebombed, by, not by the communists actually, by a, a splinter group from, from them that it's a bad way. It actually had the, it was a tragedy because it, instead of uniting the left with the mass of the working class, it divided the left from the mass of the working class for quite a while. It's like, whoa, we don't want anything to do with you people. You people are weird, you know? You're, that's, it was an absolute tragedy. In the middle, it's a farce. February is a farce. It's triumph, tragedy, and farce. Why is it a farce? Because it's February of 1921 where the people who did the open letter, who did the open letter? Paul Levy probably wrote it with Karl Radek. Who's responsible for the magnificent fact of the union of the small communist group with the larger, the left wing of the independent, the independent social democrats was a group between their NDP, it was called the Social Democratic Party, and the left, maybe 700 or 800,000 members, a mass organization. The, 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 they met in Congress in 1920, and the majority voted to join the communists. It's a magnificent moment. Who did that? Paul Levy's section of the communists and Clara Zetkin's section of the communists. They understood that that was the orientation. We need to win that section. Why is February a farce? Because this section of the leadership, the people identified with self-emancipation, with uniting with the radical workers who are outside the ranks of the communists, are forced out of the leadership by Balakun, by Zinoviev, by the agents of the Comintern working inside the, uh, German, the German left. The reasons for it is because they are saying that there's a tremendous push for, the March action is not a momentary, problem. It's not just an episodic thing that happens. There's a theory that was carried by certain leading Russians. Uh, Nikolai Bukharin carried the theory. The great, the general who led the Civil War, Tukhachevsky, held the theory. It's called the theory of the offensive. It says that at every occasion, the left needs to go on the offensive. You go on the offensive. You go on the offensive. Even if you're a minority, you go on the offensive. Why? Because that will spark 
And uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, uh, Isaac Deutscher's wonderful biography of Leon Trotsky says that in that period of time, <coughs> arguing against this theory of the offensive was his magnificent obsession. That's what he argued against over and over and over again, saying this is a dead end. If we do this, we will kill the left, we will kill our prospects, etc. Bye. Um, okay, so this is a not just a question of individuals, Paul Levy and Bella Kuhn, but they represent that they represent two different trends inside the left of the workers' movements. One representing maybe in, both of them imperfectly, but there was the trend, the trend towards self-emancipation, a sense that socialism is only possible if the left can win a hearing and win the support of the majority of the working class. The other one, a substitutionist notion that says, even when we're a minority, we can uh, spark a revolution, even if that revolution is against the majority of the working class. I think that this is strain. The reason that Luxembourg, Levy, and Zetkin were so wedded to the notion of self-emancipation and why it was so, there was an ambivalent relationship to self-emancipation in the Russian has to do, as I said earlier, with the different conditions they were in. German, Germany by 1918, 1919, 1920 is an urban country. It's an urban country with a concentrated working class in and around the cities. There is a peasantry, but it's small. And the characteristic form of the workers' movement, of the workers' movement against capitalism, is, the, is, a, is, a, is a movement of democracy, widening and widening layers of democracy towards a changed uh, 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 overthrow, overthrow of the capitalist system. Think of Russia. Russia has, a, has pockets of urbanization around St. Petersburg, around Moscow, around, in the Ukraine, around Kiev, you know, the Russian section of the Ukraine, around Kharkov. But the vast majority of the country of the empire, actually, because it's not just a country, it's an empire. The Russian empire is peasant, 140 million peasants, in very, very difficult conditions. The peasant revolution against feudalism is necessarily a substitutionist revolution. It's a milit it's a, there's an uprising by the peasantry, but it takes the form of Oliver Cromwell and the Roundheads form an army to challenge uh, the aristocracy in England, it's the Jacobin clubs in France in the French Revolution, etc. There's a militarized access, a, aspect to it. There's, a, there's a, the need for a small minority to move in the context of the society as a whole. The Russians had the interesting and complicated situation of having to do both revolutions at once. There was a peasant revolution, which is going to take that forms that we can talk about in discussion that are, whatever you say about them, are inappropriate for what we need to do in the context of the cities, the working class, etc., where we organize and talk and meet and win the battle of democracy. This is, um, so to conclude, we will not settle this discussion tonight. That's all right. Amongst other things, one of the things that I found most disturbing in my time, as I reflected upon this, and reflected upon the way in which I've learned these lessons over the years, was the way in which certain key individuals get, some are elevated and some are swept under the carpet. You should see the way in which Paul Levy is talked about by the other, by, by, by Karl Radek, by Zinoviev, by Chris Harmon from the Socialist Workers' Party. He's treated like a petty bourgeois dilettante who collected Chinese porcelain and had a lot of sexual relations. Seriously, this is what they talk about. It's ridiculous. We have to take him seriously as an individual. Rosa Luxemburg, oh, she was all right, but she didn't understand the party like Lenin. I'm sorry. We have to take much more seriously Rosa Luxemburg's contribution. Clara Zetkin, here's what Bella Kuhn says about Clara Zetkin to Lenin. He says, don't take her seriously. She's a senile. She's suffering from senile dementia. That's, what, that's how Bella Kuhn deals with Clara Zetkin. If we do nothing else, say that that approach is ridiculous, we look at Paul Levy, look at Clara Zetkin, look at Rosa Luxburg, and take them seriously and see if they have something to offer us today in the 21st century. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks to you both. There's a lot for us to talk about.